good morning, afternoon, evening, depending where where you are. And we are really happy that you could join us today for this meeting uh, specialized for Oceania and Asia. Uh, we have a diverse mix of speakers from Europe, Asia, Oceania. And the goal of, uh, Andres, can you please share your screen? I see Laura. Can you see it now? Yes. And uh, the goal of this meeting is to first connect uh, with other protistologists in the region. And the second goal is to allow early career researchers to present their work this year. So Adriana will tell you something about the first goal and I'll uh, tell you more about the second goal of this meeting. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Philip. Let me just change here so I can see with whom I'm talking. So hi, I'm Adriana. Uh, so we we have thank you everyone that's here. As Philip said, those that are sleeping also that will be watching us uh, after on uh, on the videos on the YouTube. Uh, so just. A uh, couple of notes. So this year we had uh, planned the International Society of Protistologists uh, in Cancun, and uh, so it was a great location, but yeah. a bit prohibitive for many of us that are working in Asia and uh, in Oceania, and also in other uh, underrepresented countries that often are not uh, in international meetings. So, and this is because of particularly the travel costs. So in the first edition, for example, of the Electronic Symposium of Protistology, uh, the ESOP, uh, uh, we have gathered people from North, Central, and South America, as well as Africa. And today, just for you to have an idea, and tomorrow we will be connected to people from Japan, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Philippines, from Istanbul, Hong Kong, Russia, Iraq, Israel, Singapore, of course, and many other countries in, in Europe. So it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to be connected. Uh, with other protistologists that usually you will not see uh, in the meetings. And as, although many people say that uh, the um, one on one uh, meetings uh, cannot be replaced by online meetings, uh, for some people this is the only opportunity. So we are really happy to bring this uh, to continue this work that started with Patrick Killing, with uh, Javier, and Fabienne. And uh, we hope that this will be, uh, this experiment will be part of uh, the, the meetings from now on. So welcome everyone. <laughs> Philippe, I pass to you again. Uh -huh. So this was the first goal of this meeting, to allow people from this region to join a scientific protistology meeting. And the second goal, as, as was, uh, already stated during the first meeting, uh, the cancellation of all or most of meetings this year has really created a vacuum in the field to interact with other protistologists. And we felt that this situation really affects uh, early career researchers, uh, PhD students, master students, postdocs, assistant professors, and uh, so we decided to give uh, them a chance to present uh, during this meeting. So as you can notice, this meeting is early career researcher heavy. We only have a few talks by senior people. And since the, all the meetings are canceled, uh, or most of them in-person meetings, uh, where some of the early career researchers could find their potential future supervisor, uh, fieldwork buddies, or collaborators. Assistant professors could get the, get the one invited talk that would help them to get the 
grant or fellowship they're now writing. So all these were reasons why we are giving the opportunity to early career researchers. Uh, this was also mentioned uh, in the survey after the previous meeting. And one way how we are doing it is by including the lightning talks. So uh, they're fairly short, but they're still invited talks. Uh, and we feel that the Zoom platform is uh, especially useful for, for talks like that. And we have breakout rooms where you can uh, connect with the speakers, ask more questions. So we're really looking forward to this experiment. Uh, of course, as with the previous meeting, this is fairly new to us. We're not experienced in holding virtual meetings, so please bear with us. And if I can ask Andres to move to the next slide. So here are our speakers uh, uh, with the program for today. And uh, I would just briefly uh, introduce some basic Zoom uh, rules for the participants. Uh, Andres, can you move one more slide? So if you're not presenting or asking a question, please uh, mute yourself. There's, a, there's the microphone icon on your control panel, so you can mute your microphone there. And also you can stop your video to save the bandwidth for other participants to be able to listen to the talks. So please, if you're not presenting or asking a question, um, mute your microphones and stop your videos. For asking questions, uh, you can raise your hand electronically uh, through the participant panel. Uh, then the chair will uh, give you words so you can speak up. So please introduce yourself and ask only one question to start with. Uh, try to avoid comments or multiple questions at the same time. Uh, we can have more questions from a single participant, but please wait if, if there's time left so that there's uh, time for everyone to ask questions. And you can also use the chat for asking questions and uh, you can also use the Slack workspace for that as well. Uh, I think that's all in terms of basic Zoom instructions. And we have a few more minutes. So unless there are questions or uh, any other comments from organizers, Andres, Laura, Mark, Maggie. Unless you wanna mention about the, the, the rooms after the, for the coffee breaks. Uh, yeah, or could someone else? Uh, describe the breakout rooms, Adriana or Maggie? Okay, um, uh, so as Philippe was saying, we were trying to maximize the way you can interact with the speakers. Uh, so you have the Slack where you can write to them. Uh, there is a specific channel for every um, speaker. But also, we're gonna have separate uh, room uh, Zoom uh, meetings, which you can see now the code and the password, very hard, 0000. So you can choose one of these rooms that you can just join, and uh, the speaker for that specifically uh, uh, meeting that you see now in the screen will be there, and you can just interact, chat, uh, exchange ideas, so. That's the way we find that we can maximize uh, your participation. And we, <clears throat> excuse me, we will share this slide at the end of the first session for you to uh, join the meeting with the speaker you want to ask more questions or interact more with. Um, I think I would now ask Jeff McFadden to share his screen.
And uh, in the meantime, I can introduce uh, Jeff McFadden. Jeff McFadden is a professor at the University of Melbourne in Australia, uh, famous for his work on uh, epicomplexa and dinoflagellates, especially apicoplast. Uh, it's for me. It's a. It feels like uh, in the movie Inception because Jeff is a postdoc supervisor of my postdoc supervisor. Uh, so Jeff, the, uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Philippe, and thanks to the organisers for the opportunity to talk today. It's it's fun to be back in a conference. Although I said to Patrick earlier, I'm going to miss the beer session. Um, I'm going to talk about two topics today. The first will be about a mutualistic symbiosis between uh, dinoflagellates and cnidarians like corals or anemones. And this is your classic mutualism where um, the cooperation is, is two-way and the hosts provide the dinoflagellates with nitrogen, uh, with shelter, and also with inorganic carbon. And the symbionts provide the hosts with glucose. Uh, and this glucose uh, is very important to the host. It's the primary um, source of energy for the host, particularly in uh, oligotrophic uh, coral reef waters, tropical waters. So they get the bulk of their energy from their symbionts. And these symbionts are intracellular, and I'll come back to that in some detail in the second part of the talk. And most of these symbionts, these dinoflagellates, have a free living phase, and it's facultative for them whether they're free living or symbiotic. Um, and coral bleaching, of course, which is very topical, is actually when this symbiosis breaks down and what happens is the animal actually ejects its symbionts somewhat maladaptively, but I'm not going to talk much about bleaching today. The reason that it's dangerous for the corals when they bleach is that they actually start to starve to death because there's very little food in this beautiful clear water. And so they're relying more on their symbionts to feed them than they are on um, animal feeding. And if they don't get that glucose, they starve to death and die unless they can reattain their symbionts and re-establish uh, new symbiosis when the water maybe cools down a little bit. So I've got two questions I want to talk about today. The first is how these symbionts uh, transfer glucose to the animal host? And also, the, did this uh, symbiotic transfer of glucose actually pave the way for some uh, forms of parasitism to evolve? So in thinking about how they transfer glucose uh, to their hosts, it sort of, again, took a botanical mindset. And I was thinking um, about how we get maple syrup out of maple trees. And basically, the maple syrup farmer hammers a tap into the tree, and the syrup drips out of the tap into the bucket there on the right. And this is because trees actually need to feed the non-photosynthetic parts of their structure. So the leaves photosynthesize, they um, generate sugars, and then they export those sugars out of the leaf cells, and they go into the system of pipes in the trunk of the tree, and there's a picture of them here and here. And these sugars go down towards uh, the base of the tree and into the roots, so they feed the roots, which can't photosynthesize. And the roots then, obviously, in return, take up minerals and um, water and pump these up in a different set of pipes, these slightly larger pipes over here, up to the leaves to supply them. This is a partnership really between the photosynthetic part and the non-photosynthetic part. And they have to get these sugars out of the leaves and into these pipes, which are non-cellular. They're, they're basically uh, extracellular spaces with, with the residual walls. Plants also pump out sugars um, to fill up nectaries and attract pollinators. And they also load a lot of sugar into um, seeds that can then be polymerized into starch uh, for storage for the next generation. And nobody really knew how plants did this up until uh, 10 years ago when a German um, transport biologist, Bob Frommer, um, discovered a new set of proteins or transporters that he dubbed sweets. And sweet stands for sugars will eventually be exported transporters. And um, they published these, as I said, uh, first ones about 10 years ago. They discovered that they're seven transmembrane um, helix proteins and they are what we call uh, in transport biology facilitators of diffusion or uniporters. So they have just a single substrate, uh, which is the sugar. Since they were first discovered in plants, uh, they've subsequently turned up in the genomes of animals and protists and um, prokaryotes. So they're pretty much a ubiquitous kind of transporter, but as uh, first discovered by former in plants. And so far, the known substrates are glucose, uh, fructose, and sucrose. And um, so another German colleague of mine, Andreas uh, Weber, suggested that these might be the ideal kind of transporters to look for 
in uh, how dinoflagellates could transport glucose out to their uh, animal hosts. So we had a quick look in the genome and bingo, um, came out with a very nice hit. So this is an alignment of uh, a sweet candidate from Breviolum minutum, which used to be known as Symbiodinium clade B, but has been renamed uh, to B minutum. And here it is aligned to the Arabidopsis thaliana, the plant suite number eight. And you can see a very, very strongly uh, conserved protein here. And we found uh, a number of sweets in all of the symbiotic, different symbiotic dinoflagellates. And they were either absent or in very small gene families in non-symbiotic dinoflagellates. So this immediately started to smell right. Um, and then we also had a, a similar time been doing an, um, a comparative gene expression analysis in dinoflagellates when they were living as in their free living state in an in vitro culture versus dinoflagellates here, which are, you can see this red autofluorescence in this little anemone. And so Karen uh, Mia Landau in my lab uh, did an RNA-seq analysis um, of the free living dinoflagellates versus the dinoflagellates in their host and identified those genes which were upregulated and potentially implicated as being important in symbiosis. And BM suite one uh, that I showed you in the previous slide was one of the ones that was upregulated in hospitae, so when the dinoflagellates are in their host cells. So it was immediately an attractive candidate. Um, it has um, a very uh, similar predicted structure to the plant suites with seven uh, transmembrane helices and model predictions of the structure suggest that it is a, a seven transmembrane helix membrane protein with the N-terminus uh, jutting out of the cell and the C-terminus uh, in the cytoplasmic space. And so Karen uh, then set up with three questions to answer for this project um, based on the fact that it was very probably a sweet protein and therefore probably a bi-directional sugar transporter. We wanted to know where it's located, uh, when is it expressed and what is it at its um, preferred substrate of this protein. So Karen um, generated some antiserum to this protein and you can see a nice Western blot here where it decorates a single band. And if she um, pre-incubates that serum with the peptide that was used to immunize the rabbits, then that um, binding to that band is uh, abrogated. So we think this is a nice specific antiserum. She then went ahead to um, identify where the protein is in the dinoflagellates. So here's uh, a little field of 10 dinoflagellates. Uh, you can see their nuclei stained here with DAPI and their chlorophyll autofluorescence. And this is the um, sweet antiserum here. And so this is quite striking. It, it decorates around the uh, periphery of the dinoflagellate um, very strongly. And you can see in the merged cells here. So then we wanted to know exactly where this um, uh, transporter candidate was in the um, uh, dinoflagellates. And so we switched to doing electron microscopy with this with immunogold. And so this is a section of um, a C anemone tentacle and you can see the two uh, layers of the animal. Here you can see the epidermis here, and this is full of nidocysts here. So these are the ejectile cells that nidarians um, shoot out to harpoon prey or to paralyze their prey. And then there's the mesoglea in here, and then there's the gastrodermis here. And all of these round cells in the gastrodermis are dinoflagellates, the symbiotic dinoflagellates. So they're very, very packed with these dinoflagellates. And if we zoom in on this area here, you can see each of these uh, separate dinoflagellates, each of them in a separate vacuole. Uh, this is their plastid here, and this is their nucleus with the uh, semi-condensed chromosomes here and over here. And this is EM work done by uh, Alison Vandermeen in our department. So the uh, anemones are packed with these dinoflagellates and each of them is in a vacuole, which we call the symbiosome um, inside the animal tissue, inside the animal cells. And looking at the immunogold labeling, if we zoom down on this dinoflagellate here, you can see the, the cell wall out here, um, the plastid is here, and you can see the gold labeling uh, along the plasma membrane here. And here's a whole uh, cell here, this one hasn't been stained. But if you look at the labeling down here, uh, you get a very intense uh, set of labeling along this plasma membrane. So the um, protein is in the plasma membrane of the dinoflagellate, which is where we'd expect it to be if it was an exporting protein. Um, then Karen wanted to follow up on her RNA-seq analysis at the protein level and determine um, whether there was a difference in expression of the protein in the free living dinoflagellates versus uh, the dinoflagellates that were, that were in the host. And 
treatments. After some time, she opted to do this by immunofluorescence microscopy. Um, and so here's uh, some free living dinoflagellates. Here's a dinoflagellate again showing that um, anti sweet labeling here in the periphery of the cell. There's the merge with the, the chlorophyll autofluorescence and the DNA. And these are dinoflagellates from inside the host. And both these images are taken um, with the same labeling protocol and the same uh, gain settings and everything identical on the microscope. And so we can actually um, call this a, a, a quantitative difference in the intensity of the fluorescence with this antibody labeling. You can see very clearly that the, the fluorescence intensity here is, is way stronger when the dinoflagellates are living in the host versus when they're free living. And Karen went ahead to quantify that in a um, um, extensive way. And so what she did was she measured the mean fluorescence intensity of individual cells and she chose to do it for more than 100 cells and she did it on three separate experiments. And so these are again the free living labeling levels which equates to this is what you would see in the microscope with these um, uh, 300 and some odd cells. And then when she looked at the, uh, the cells in host, you can see that there's um, significantly more uh, fluorescence intensity as uh, represented by this single image here. And then the control for that was to uh, label, again, in the same three experiments, free living uh, dinoflagellates and dinoflagellates uh, from the host with uh, emitting the primary antiserum. And you can see that there's um, a very uh, low background level of fluorescence in these cells. And in fact, the level of um, protein in the free living cells with the antibody is not a lot greater than the level of um, uh, fluorescence intensity without any antibody whatsoever. So this is a very, very low expression level by comparison with this one here. So we knew where the protein was and we knew that it was um, substantially upregulated when the dinoflagellates entered a symbiosis with uh, the host. And the next question was really what the um, transport substrate was. And this was uh, experiments performed by um, my old friend, Andreas Weber, who we've collaborated with on transporters in the past, and his postdoc, Marion Eisenhut, uh, did a lot of these experiments. And the way they do this is to take a yeast mutant uh, which is uh, deficient in hexose transport. Sounds pretty simple, but they actually had to knock out um, 18 genes in the yeast to uh, disable its, all of its hex ability to import hexoses. And this mutant's called EBY4000. Um, so what you then do is you transform this yeast mutant uh, with an expression vector that expresses the protein of interest, uh, which you believe might be a sugar transporter. And so this is what that looks like. Um, this is the, the mutant yeast here and you get a little colony here. And they can of course grow on maltose, which is a disaccharide. So they can still import a disaccharide, disaccharide but not a, not a hexose. Um, and so this uh, mutant has then been um, transformed with three different uh, putative transporters. Um, well, there's, there's two known transporters and uh, the, the Breviolum minutum uh, sweet one transporter. We also have a control here with um, just the empty uh, expression vector here. And so on maltose, all of these um, yeast colonies grow quite well if there's uracil included in the media. And these ones have been, um, then you, what you can do is uh, you can plate them out on maltose with or without uracil. If you leave the uracil out here, you can see that the, uh, the mutant without any vector um, doesn't grow on maltose. And that's because there's um, actually a uracil synthase uh, gene encoded on the vector as well as the, the place for the expression of the transporter. So this just simply allows you to select for those yeast strains which actually do are transfected with uh, the expression vector. Then what you do obviously is do it on the test substrate, uh, plate them onto glucose instead of maltose and you get your result. And so this is a great day. Um, you can see here that the, um, the yeast um, transfectants uh, complemented with the uh, Breviolum minutum sweet one, um, do grow, and uh, these ones don't grow, and if they've got the empty vector, they don't grow. Uh, we had two other controls in this experiment. So Arabidopsis thaliana sweet one is a known glucose transporter from plants, uh, and of course that grows on the glucose uh, substrate. And Arabidopsis thaliana sweet 11 uh, is a sucrose transporter with uh, no affinity for glucose transport, and that doesn't glow on the glucose uh, plates. You can also um, do another negative control on these, or, um, or kind of a positive negative control, I guess you'd call it. And what you do is plate them on maltose so that they should grow uh, like this. 
but you also incorporate into them uh, agar 2-deoxyglucose, uh, which is actually a toxic analogue of glucose. So if they can import this hexose, it will actually kill them. And so now you get this experiment, uh, which is the reciprocal of this. Um, so the only um, algae, uh, sorry, the only yeast that grow are the ones that don't express hexose transporter. So they um, can't import the 2-deoxyglucose, but they can use the maltose and also the um, yeast expressing the sucrose transporter here. So they can grow on the maltose and they can't import the deoxyglucose so they don't die. But those um, yeasts with the, with the ability to import glucose, such as the glucose transporter from the plant, they die and also the Breviola minutum sweet one uh, algae die. So um, this is a very strong uh, set of evidence that this Breviola minutum um, sweet candidate is a glucose transporter. We also um, started to look at whether it had any other potential substrates and um, it can transport glucose as I showed in the previous slides and, and that's represented again here, these are the, the same ones. If we substitute fructose instead of glucose, you can see some modest growth here for the Breviola minutum, but it's, it's pretty low. And um, we also tested sucrose and I don't have a slide of that uh, to share with you yet but it looks like it has no ability to transport sucrose um, and we have the sucrose uh, positive uh, control in that for the sweet 11. So what we've got at this stage is evidence that um, Breviola minutum sweet one is uh, a very strong candidate for the transporter that supplies glucose to the host. It's in the correct place. You'd expect it to be in the plasma membrane. Uh, it's upregulated quite substantially in the host and I'll, I'll speak about why we think that makes sense in a minute. Uh, and it has the, the correct uh, substrate specificity. And the fact that it's either absent or in much reduced gene families in non-symbiotic relatives um, is congruent with the fact that it's a symbiotic um, transporter. So this leads me to the sort of second part of this presentation, which is, um, did this kind of glucose transfer actually pave the way for parasitism? So if you think about symbiosis, it's classically represented as some kind of uh, sliding continuum, where it's say this uh, left-hand extreme, we have a classic mutualism between a coral and its symbiotic um, dinoflagellates and other uh, symbionts that corals contain. Uh, in the middle, you can have a commensalism where uh, one organism probably benefits, but the other partner of the symbiosis is relatively neutral. And at the far right, you have something like a parasitism where uh, the symbiont benefits massively, but the host actually suffers uh, some kind of uh, evolutionary cost to its fitness. And I've always been interested in whether you can actually convert from a mutualism to a parasitism uh, and change the position of the organism, the symbiont, along uh, the lineage of the symbiont along this uh, continuum. And really my interest in this goes back to uh, an experiment that was done um, before most of you were born, uh, in which I showed that the apicomplexin parasites had photosynthetic ancestors by identifying um, a plastid, uh, which Philippe referred to as the apicoplast. And what was interesting about this at the time was that we knew that uh, apicomplexin parasites were the sister lineage to dinoflagellates and belonged with the ciliates in this uh, clade called the alveolates. And the identification of a plastid in this lineage suggested that the lineage had originally been photosynthetic and had somehow lost photosynthesis and this then became uh, the apicoplast. And so thinking about this in uh, more detail, it's quite interesting because dinoflagellates are, are fantastic symbionts and they can enter into symbiotic interactions uh, with all of these cnidarians like um, jellyfish and, and anemones and uh, corals but they can also enter into symbiosis with mollusks, uh, with sponges, um, with flatworms. Um, they can enter also into symbiosis with protists like forams and ciliates. So they're really good at um, forming symbiosis with all kinds of animals and, and even other protists. And we had also predicted that these um, organisms in the ape complexa were originally photosynthetic and that there might've been some uh, transition form where there was a photosynthetic um, symbiont of animals that was more on this apicomplexin lineage than it was on the dinoflagellate lineage. And this uh, sort of missing link organism that we proposed in, in 1997 was, was found uh, 
about a decade later by Bob Moore and Dee Carter and other colleagues, uh, and this is the, the Chromera belly or, or the Chromerids. So these kind of filled in uh, some of the transition forms uh, for this conversion from mutualism, photosynthetic mutualism, to non-photosynthetic parasitism. What's interesting about this is each of these uh, lineages here are capable of participating in intracellular symbiotic interactions with animals. And so dinoflagellates are photosynthetic, chromerids remain photosynthetic, but this organism lost photosynthesis but retains an apicoplast. So we think that this split is around about 500 million years old, depending on, uh, on the fossils of dinoflagellates that are quite well preserved. Um, so we think that the, the, the ancestor, common ancestor of dinoflagellates, chromerids and apicomplexa was older than 500 million years. Um, and thinking about this on a, one of the things you don't get to do on these um, Zoom conferences is to go on nice field trips. And this is the field trip from the Protostology Conference in Canada, where we went up to the Burgess Shale and um, observed all these amazing fossils. And it started me thinking that this organism, uh, this trilobite, which is around about 500 million years old, might have had some kind of symbionts, or the other invertebrates in this uh, water body might have had some kind of symbionts that were an ancestor of dinoflagellates, an ancestor of chromerids, and an ancestor of uh, apicomplexans. So this is kind of some kind of symbiont slash parasite uh, ancestral to these organisms. And Noriko Okamoto, when she was in my lab, uh, wrote a little uh, review piece about the chromerid discovery and thought about the timelines uh, for this. So this is a, a tree a bit like I showed you before, apicomplexa, chromera, um, dinoflagellates and ciliates here, and with a timeline estimate here of around about 480 million years. And if you think about what animals were um, present at that time, we're talking about the very simplest animals, sponges, cnidarians, uh, and worms, and uh, mollusks. So this is interesting that this symbiotic ability in the dinoflagellates uh, occurred at about the same time as whoop. We just had a crash. Sorry about that. I'll blame that on the Rika. I'll skip the rest of her slide. Um, so this sort of begs the question of how did this lineage learn to uh, steal glucose from the host rather than supply it to the host when they stopped photosynthesizing? And I think the answer to this is in the sweet proteins. So thinking about transport biology, sweet proteins are what we call um, facilitation diffusion or diffusion facilitators. And what they do is they take their substrate from a region of high concentration and they allow it to diffuse uh, without the expenditure of any energy to the region of low concentration. Um, and what's interesting about this kind of diffusion is that it's reversible. So if your concentration gradient switches, um, the direction of transport will simply reverse. So this means that diffusion facilitators such as the sweets are what we call bidirectional. Uh, the transport will simply go in uh, the direction of the uh, substrate gradient. So the sweets should be able to run in both directions, which they do in plants. And so in the dinoflagellate, the sweet, which is represented here, allows glucose to diffuse outwards from its source in the dinoflagellate through photosynthesis outwards towards the host. And um, in, the, in the yeast, what that ex, uh, experiment proves, the complementation experiment proves that it actually runs in the opposite direction. The glucose has to come into the yeast cell uh, from the um, agar plate to enable the yeast to grow and the, and the facilitator has to allow that. And so in a sense, this yeast is now able to be a glucose thief um, because it has uh, a hexose importer that we've put into it from the dinoflagellate. So this is a, um, my brand new hypothesis, uh, which I call when sweets turn sour. And it really, I think, nicely rationalizes the origin of parasitism. So this is a collection of um, the motile invasive forms of a bunch of apicomplexa by um, Schultisek and Aikawa. Um, and all of these parasites, if you search in their genomes, they contain uh, sweet genes. And I think these sweet genes are what allow them to become glucose thieves. And sweets are quite nice because they offer the first sort of molecular explanation of how you convert from being mutualistic uh, to parasitic as a symbiont. And so I think sweets actually created the phylum complexa, which is um, certainly at least 6,000 different species of uh, animal parasites. 
And Sweets also quite nicely rationalised how we get parallel origins of parasitism. So, and I'll talk about this in the, in the coming slide. Things like Perkinsids and Apicomplexa appear to be actually convergent um, on parasitism from mutualism. And there's also uh, recent inferences of multiple conversions to parasitism within the Gregorines by um, Patrick Healing's lab and Jan Januskovic's uh, lab. And the Swedes would also explain this. So what I think is going on is that this is our, our hypothetical ancestor of um, the, um, the dinoflagellates, uh, Perkinsids, um, Chromerids, and uh, apicomplexans and uh, colpidellids and probably even coralicolids. Um, and so it was a mutualistic photosynthetic symbiont that exported glucose to its host using uh, a sweet protein. And this can become a glucose thief if it loses photosynthesis. So this is the symbiont here. It's got a sweet protein here, a photosynthetic plastic that manufactures glucose and that glucose comes out in the cytoplasm is used by the organism. And if that organism is in a symbiosis, it will then export this glucose. So probably when it's in a free living phase, it do, do, um, represses the expression of this sweet so that it doesn't lose glucose out to the oxygen. But if there happens to be a host uh, in its environment and it's able to enter symbiosis with that host and start to colonize it, it can prosper in that host because it's actually able to induce the expression of uh, sweet and export glucose uh, to the host. And so this is the symbiont here and it's inside um, a vacuole here, which is a symbiosome, uh, which is sort of like the vacuole that surrounds apicomplex and parasites. Um, and so the sweet is upregulated and the glucose that's manufactured in here is exported to the host. And this forms a mutualistic benefit to both organisms, okay? And there's a glucose um, source here in the plastid by photosynthesis. And there's a glucose sink here from the host, which is burning the glucose um, to grow and, metab and uh, to fuel its metabolism. However, if this plastid then acquires a mutation that stops photosynthesis, the gradient is actually now automatically reversed. There's no source of glucose in the symbiont. And so the sweet would actually allow the glucose to flow back in from the host here into this sink here in this now non-photosynthetic um, organism. There's a couple of nice attractive things about this process. It doesn't require anything to happen except for the plastid to obtain some kind of mutant that stops it photosynthesizing. And you can think of you know, thousands of mutations that would do that in a symbiont. Um, the sweet just instantly runs backwards. And what that does is it actually rescues this mutant. So this now non-photosynthetic symbiont is rescued by its sweet proteins and is able to still survive and steal glucose uh, from the host. So putting this into a sort of a bit more of an evolutionary context, if we have a tree here with dinoflagellates, their sister group, the Kinsids, and over here we have this um, apicomplexan lineage with its sister group, Chromerids. Um, at some point, maybe here, but maybe earlier, they acquired a secondary plastid and, and, and the ability to photosynthesize. I think the ability to be intracellular symbionts can also be put on this stem here um, because it's pervasive throughout all of the, um, the lineages uh, on this stem. Um, and then here in Perkinsons, we had a loss of photosynthesis, but that didn't matter because uh, the sweet was able to reverse and glucose could go in from the host into this non-photosynthetic plastid. And the same can be said when a loss of photosynthesis occurred on this apicomplexan lineage and the glucose was able to still get, uh, or the, the symbionts were rescued by having a sweet that allowed them to import glucose from the host. So maybe the mother of all parasites lineage is actually not so much here, but right down here uh, in this formation of these kind of organisms. Jeff, I'm sorry. Okay, this is our last slide. Thank you. That's it. Uh, so I'd just like to thank the funders. I, uh, most of this work was done by Karen um, Merlandau on a grant that I held with Madeleine Van Oppen. And I'm particularly grateful to my um, German colleagues, particularly um, Andreas for suggesting sweets as a possible candidate uh, and from his team for doing uh, the substrate work. And also to Maggie Brisbane, who translated my title into emojis and made me look very modern. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for a really nice talk. So now uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So if you uh, can raise your hand. So I see that Yuchi Yuchiro Kashiyama uh, has a question. So please unmute yourself. And yeah. Can you hear? Yes, I can hear. 
I think I simply missed uh, what you said. Um, what was the, uh, I thought you said some external factor um, upregulating the um, expression of sweet. Was it correct? I don't know what the factor is. It's, it's apparently entering into symbiosis, but um, there are oh, a you don't, know the don't know the factor. Okay. Uh, so then there's a, a next question in the chat. Thanks for the super interesting talk. Have you thought about looking at sweet function as coral anemones are exposed to thermal stress and bleaching? Uh, there are some studies suggest, suggesting retention of sugars by coral dinoflagellates uh, is a precursor of and or potential trigger of coral bleaching. Yeah, that, that's a, good, a great suggestion. I've, um deliberately stayed out of the bleaching field. Uh, it's quite a, um, a fast moving and complicated and, and political field. Um, I think your idea is quite interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, the question was by Luke Morris, sorry. And we have uh, the next question by Patrick Keeling. Patrick, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, hi, nice talk, Jeff. Um, uh, maybe you mentioned this and I missed it, but what do other symbionts do things that are well established lineages of symbionts like chlorella and so forth. Do they use the same strategy? Don't think anyone's looked. Um, not that I'm aware. Because they should turn into parasites, maybe, like some things in the Trabuxiophytes have done. Yeah. Um, I guess there's, there's a number of different ways you could export glucose uh, and. Um, we found some other transporters as well, a sucrose transporter and the dinoflagellates or putative sucrose transporter. And, you know, maybe they can um, also export sucrose or um, that remains to be seen. But it looks like from the metabolomic experiments that John Pringle did, that glucose is the, the, pre, the, the prime substrate that's exported. Uh, thank you, Jeff. So now I would ask uh, Kevin Wakeman from the Hokkaido University in Japan to share his screen. So the next oh, uh, talk is a, I got a, a, a can uh, Jeff please turn off his uh, oh, screen Jeff, sharing. Can you please unshare your screen? And then I can. Right. And Kevin will follow with a talk on epicomplexants, on marine epicomplexants. So Kevin is an assistant professor at the Hokkaido University, and he focuses on marine epicomplexants epi such as gregorines. Uh, yeah, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, that was actually um, a really good segue uh, to this epicomplexa talk. Uh, today, I was actually just going to be talking a little bit about two themes uh, that I'm currently working on. So any input or suggestions is, uh, is really nice. Most of these projects I'm going to talk about today, uh, I just started uh, even six months, seven months ago. So uh, I'm going to particularly be talking about a little bit at, about AP complex and biodiversity that I've been looking at, and also a little bit about speciation patterns, which I've become more interested in uh, during my studies. So um, just a little food for thought. So we talked about how many species there are in AP complexa. Uh, something that kind of captivates me is this idea that every metazoan likely plays host to at least one AP complex and parasite. And as a, just a bit of a thought experiment, uh, just think about ourselves. We have a number of different AP complexins, parasites of blood, uh, toxoplasma, and also things that in the intestine, so cryptosporidium and other coccidia. Um, I'm very interested in the marine environment, uh, in particular these uh, marine invertebrates uh, and their diversity. And so uh, one thing I've been working on are these uh, AP complexin in shellfish. And I've been doing this work with some uh, collaborators through this JSPS bilateral grant. Uh, with New Zealand down at the Cawthron Institute in Nelson. And Jonathan, Steve, and Song, she was a PhD student also leading this work. Uh, we were looking at uh, AP complexa in, in bivalves. And we initially kind of went at this work uh, doing sequencing and hybridization. And now we're actually, uh, with a new grant that we got, we're gonna be looking at uh, different types of AP complexins that are found in shellfish in Japan. And so these are very typical histological staining of AP complexins that you see in shellfish. They're kind of these amorphous uh, pink dots. Uh, we don't really know exactly how much diversity there really is there because there's not a lot of uh, genetic data, maybe only a, a handful 
And this is something that this project uh, we set out to try to fix. Uh, one, one method we thought instead of doing hybridizations on all the studies is we were gonna do a method of laser capture, which will allow us to utilize um, all these different uh, of, uh, banks of tissue banks that we have available to us, the things that have been fixed and put into paraffin blocks. Um, and this is actually a video uh, using the UV and ultraviolet light where we're able to take a look at the section and cut it out of the slide. And so this gives us the ability to take a look at an AP complexin uh, that we have of interest and remove it from the slide in order to get uh, genetic information and um, using this, you can kind of see that there's a, uh, you can kind of see this pattern right here where you have the cells and then after the cutting, and then we're able to get about, uh, with the formalin fixed samples, up to a maximum about 300 base pairs. Um, but lately, uh, with new samples, I, I used a methanol based fixation and we were able to get a little bit over a thousand base pairs. So this is going to be a really cool method as we go through uh, different types of cell shellfish. Um, next topic I wanted to talk about is the speciation patterns, uh, in particular using Gregorian AP complexins and their invertebrate hosts as a model. So this is uh, a nereid, so this is a worm, a typical polyQC, and, and these are some Gregorians that are found in the gut lumen, also at Salomon cavity. Uh, this is a diversity of Gregorians. This is some work that I did during my PhD in Vancouver. Uh, you can see that there's just a whole bunch of different types of diversity, and here's a couple of really cool videos, some things I found recent. So you can get an idea of the type of diversity that you can really see in AP complexins. Um, here's another video of, uh, uh, this is called the Veloxidium. And so uh, one question I was kind of having is, is how do we actually get this type of diversity? So how does it move through all these different invertebrate groups? Uh, and so this is just kind of a general overlook of this uh, uh, different patterns of what parasites can do inside the host. So whether or not it stops being a parasite or ceases to exist, whether or not it speciates within the same host or does something host switching um, or uh, does some sort of, uh, let me move this real quick, my computer's, this co-speciation where it'll actually switch and I, uh, uh, when the host speciates, the parasite will actually speciate with that at that point in time. And I wanted to take a look to see what type of pattern um, existed and one really interesting thing I recently found back in November was I went on a, a cruise. Uh, this is the Toyoshi Omaru back in November through Hiroshima University. We were down in the southern part of Japan. Uh, we were doing these uh, pelagic zooplankton at about a thousand meters deep. And I was looking at these salp. This is salpa fusiformis. It's kind of a cosmopolitan salp that you find all over the world. This is the lab set up on the boat. Uh, what I found inside the salp is kind of interesting. So when I was looking at these Gregorians within the salp, um, if anybody takes a look, uh, see what's, uh, what this is like, or to, to see what this is actually similar to, uh, this is actually very reminiscent of a uh, crustacean parasite. So the way that they're having the, their syzygy right here, so their sexual reproduction uh, is very similar, at least to me, uh, to these uh, crustacean parasites. And that kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And, this is actually the salp gut right here, and you can see the parasite is inside the salp. Um, this is just some uh, SEM photographs that I took and then some more TEM. Again, this, is, uh, this TEM actually, again, was very similar to other crustacean parasites that the light microscopy was also reminiscent of. And sure enough, when I did the sequencing, uh, the sequence of this parasite actually came out within a clade that was exclusive, at least uh, to this point in time, to uh, Gregorian uh, parasites of crustaceans, which is kind of unique, kind of special. Um, I really wanted to take a look because salp have this interaction with copepods where they kind of live inside either as parasites or uh, commensal. And uh, oh, what time are we at? Five minutes already? Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, we are over five minutes, but oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going. So I'll, I'll finish up here real quick. Uh, so anyways, basically what I found was that they were in the same clade, and so this gave an idea that copepods uh, was part of this whole host switching event because they have this uh, close relationship. And then it's not exactly, uh, it's not an isolated to Japan. This is something that we see globally. Um, the other thing I'm looking at, this is something I just started six months ago, was the idea that uh, looking at how they might have co-speciated co uh, within their host. So there's different types of patterns. And I was going to in particular look at tunicates 
because they have a high host specificity, high infection rates, the cosmopolitan. They can't really run away from you, so they're easy to get. Uh, this is some preliminary work I did with Sonia Rooker. Um, we did this over in Vancouver, and we actually found that uh, tunicates, no matter how what they look like, uh, they actually are very quite different, and this difference actually corresponds to the host. So there does appear to be a pattern of high amounts of host specificity. And what I wanted to do was scale this project up in order to get a look at the convergence of the two groups. Um, and then I did some dive work right here. This is in Guam, where we were looking at tunicates. And what I found, and the coronavirus actually stopped this research, uh, this is what I dug up so far between New Zealand, Canada, Japan, and down in Guam. So right now I'm trying to build that data set and then get back to work to try to answer those questions. So anyways, thanks to uh, people in New Zealand, Canada, uh, Okinawa, people that helped me out, and uh, Toyoshi Maru down in Takahara Marine Lab, um, and also in Guam, the Lima Lab to help me out. So thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Uh, thank you, Kevin. So there, are, there is no time for questions oh, located well, after the fine. lightning talks, but if anyone's interested in Kevin's work, uh, please join the meeting with him during the coffee break to ask more questions. Yeah. And uh, Actually, I, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I actually, I got to go play dad. <laughs> so, in 20, oh, okay, so in 20, in 20 minutes, I got to go pick up my kids. So anyways, so thanks guys for Email listening. Kevin and yes. ask more about it. Email. Anyway, so thank can you I ask much. you to unshare your screen and I will do so. the next speaker to share? Stop share screen. Okay, uh, Ruth, can you share your screen? Yes. So while Ruth is sharing uh, her slides with us, uh, her presentation with us, uh, so we will continue within our relates um, with Ruth. Uh, she's a plant, plankton uh, biologist. Uh, she has established the, she used to work with uh, HABS and she has established, she has helped to establish the first testing facility uh, in Tasmania for detecting of um, HABS in salmonids and selfish uh, uh, industry. Uh, this experience led her to today to be uh, uh, working in several uh, long-term monitoring programs uh, in, in Australia also. She's part of CSIRO, but she will talk about her love uh, with uh, teaching needs through the microscope today. So, Ruth, are you on? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you. And you've got my screen sharing okay? Yeah. Thank you. If you could please just give me a bit of a heads up at about 15 minutes so that I can try and keep on time. It'd be great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone from cold, wet, windy Hobart. Um, we are in the midst of a very severe low pressure system here. So I'm hoping that my power and internet connection don't go out in the, while we're in the symposium. Um, I want to talk to you today about two of my favourite groups of protists, which are the tintinids and the phytoplankton that associate with them. Um, and this is a morphology-based exploration of what I call a microscopist stream. And I hope that you can see as we go through the talk just how wondrous and beautiful and curious this group of organisms are. So I'd like to start with saying thank you to the organisers of the symposium. I'm really missing the opportunity to meet, um, to go to meetings and um, conferences and to learn from other researchers. So this is really filling a gap for me. Thank you so much. Um, my thanks to the Plankton team at CSIRO where I work and my University of Tasmania colleagues. Um, and a big shout out to the postdocs and PhD students. I know this is a difficult time for you to remain uh, enthusiastic and energetic about your research, so this talk is dedicated for you. I'd like to acknowledge the Integrated Marine Observing System and the Australian Antarctic Division who um, allow us to conduct um, strategic research on a continental scale around Australia um, and in the Antarctic and the Electron Microscopy Unit in particular at the AAD um, and all my collaborators and mentors for sharing their knowledge and images and microscopic delight over the years. Just a couple of notes here. So I'm a microscopist and a parataxonomist, so I use morphology almost exclusively in my work. 
Um, we all know that taxonomy can change very quickly with new information and especially with new um, molecular techniques. Um, but we have to kind of ground truth observations at some point um, against the standard reference. So I use the World Register of Marine Species um, for currently accepted nomenclature. So where I've attached a name here, I've drawn it from um, what's accepted in worms. Um, and just um, so that you know what kind of references I'm using, I rely on this. This is just a subset, but these kind of works um, are beside me uh, constantly. So we can... Um, trace the taxonomy and where I'm assigning names to species. So we start off with what, what are the tintinids? If you haven't seen them before, they are um, unicellular planktonic protists that are found in marine and estuarine systems, but they're a little bit rarer in fresh waters. They're part of the microplankton. They're typically in the 20 to 200 micron range, but they can be a little bit bigger than that. Um, and they're grazers, so they feed on the phytoplankton and bacteria at the bottom of the food chain. And in turn, they can become prey for um, uh, a variety of consumers in um, marine food webs. Um, we can find them in the tropics, in temperate regions, um, and in the high latitudes. And species can be distributed um, globally, they can be cosmopolitan, or they can have very sort of niche restricted distributions like polar sea ice associations. There are about 1200 species, but what they have in common is this um, morphology and that there is the ciliate here with an oral and an aboral end and it resides inside this very delicate, beautifully um, constructed, um, highly um, architectured um, vase or house, it's called a lorica. The attachment um, between the ciliate and the lorica is here with the contractile peduncle. Um, and in times of stress or as part of um, the reproductive cycle, the ciliate can detach and abandon the lorica. And so what we're often left with is in samples is this empty lorica. And this is the only um, morphology, morphological clues that we have about the ID. There is a lot of um, morphological information um, also that um, we can extract from the ciliate, but many, many times the ciliate has abandoned the lorica by the time we get the sample. There's two broad groups of tintinids. Um, these higher line species where they are, have a naked or clear lorica um, and these species that we call agglutinating. So they're attaching um, other protists to the outside or other particles to the outside of the lorica. And there are some genera that can have high line or agglutinating species. There is incredible plasticity in the forms um, and genetic studies are critical for interpreting this morphological diversity. I've been interested for a long time in this process of agglutination and that this sort of the artistry of attachment. Um, I'm particularly interested in where the tintinids use biogenic particles, so diatoms or coccolithophores. So we can see in these examples, these SEMs here. Um, but there are some genera that also use non-biogenic particles like sand or mineral flakes. Um, and these are more common. This habit of agglutination is more common in the smaller tintinid taxa. Um, and it's presumed that it must benefit the tintinid in some way through protection, through armoring, um, through camouflage or ballasting so that the tintinid can rapidly sink to escape predation. When we start to look for records of tintinids in our region, so Australia and the Southern Ocean and the Antarctic continent, and we start to look to some of these global biogeographies and regional biogeographies, we can see that there is actually a big lack of observations in this region. Um, and it's because of that, um, the taxonomy of the group has not been systematically studied across these very large latitudinal and temperature gradients. Partly due to the fact that when we're working in the Southern Ocean in Antarctica, um, sampling is seasonally limited. We're restricted to the summer um, Antarctic resupply season often for marine research voyages. Um, but we've been able to employ a variety of sampling techniques that can give us information um, about um, who's, who's there and where they are um, to give us clues about diversity, biogeography and ecology. We're very fortunate in Australia that we have the Integrated Marine Observing System, which provides us with a structure and a funding program for sustained long-term biological observations um, on a continental scale. 
There's two programs that I work with at CSIRO and they are the national reference stations. So they're shown here in the red dots on the map. There were originally nine, but we currently actively maintain seven of these and we sample them on a monthly basis for phytoplankton and zooplankton and a whole host of biogeographic, um, biochemical parameters and sensor data. Um, and the other major surveys are the continuous plankton recorder surveys. So there's the Australian CPR and the Southern Ocean CPR survey, and they're shown here in these lines. So these are um, what we call a ship of opportunity um, program, where this is a towed sampling device that's towed behind the ship. Um, can be a trade vessel or a research vessel, um, and the design of this sampler is unchanged since the 1930s. So it's an incredibly reliable and um, rugged sampling device. What it does is give us um, resolution at about five nautical mile segments. So we cut the silk when it comes back to the lab into five nautical mile sections, and each of those points becomes a dot on these long lines, and the toes are repeated seasonally. We get observations of the timtinids in both the phytoplankton and the zooplankton samples that we do in the surveys and we can also archive these silks so that they're available for molecular studies or um, other types of studies and the data from these is all freely available through the integrated marine observing system. An example of the types of information that we can start to pull together from our region by using these long-term monitoring programs is to start to generate our own regional biogeographies of species distributions. So these two genera on the left are agglutinating species, so they both um, Tintinopsis and Codinopsis both agglutinate um, biogenic particles, uh, non-biogenic particles, and Codinopsis may also agglutinate um, biogenic particles. Um, and these two genera on the right, Dadaella and Rabdanella, are what we call higher lines. So they're, um, their uh, loricas are clear um, and they're not agglutinated. Um, each of these dots is a sample where we've looked for um, evidence of the presence of these genera or species and the coloured dots are where those um, species or genera have been found. So we've got presence absence maps. These can be um, reborn, uh, expressed as percentage frequency of abundance or relative abundance. Um, and the combination of these continuous plankton records and the national reference station records allows us to build a picture of um, greatest richness towards the equators um, and less diversity towards the pole. Um, and this is, um, you know, um, consistent with um, this is a beautiful example of a, um, looking at global trends in plankton diversity um, from the Tara Oceans expedition that was published last year in Cell. And so this is just the panel for the eukaryotes um, showing an increase in species richness around the equator and decreasing towards the poles. And what we're hoping is that in time, as, as we've verified our taxonomic ideas, that um, our regional, our um, biogeographies can start to get taken up into some of these global products which currently show um, no records in our part of the world's oceans. Another long time series that we use to can study phytoplankton and tintinids is the Southern Ocean Time Series. So we maintain um, a permanent mooring in about four and a half thousand metres of water um, in the subantarctic zone at 47 south. So we're here just south of the subtropical front. Um, and by housing um, this remote access sampler within the surface float assembly of the mooring, we're able to collect samples approximately fortnightly for phytoplankton and biogeochemical parameters from the surface mix layer. Um, and this gives us full annual monitoring of a region that's logistically very difficult to sample. When these samples come back to uh, Hobart once a year, um, I am able to look at them with light and electron microscopy and all these data streams, including <coughs> the sensors and sediment traps and live data streams are freely available through IMOS. So over a number of years of observations, we've been able to build a bit of a picture of the tintinid and phytoplankton community composition. Um, there's a bit of a um, gallery here of some of the more common genera that we encounter. We're seeing moderate diversity, but always in very low abundance. And the tintinids are a fairly minor component of the microplankton. We see peak abundances in summer. So we've got a plot here of um, cells from the austral spring coming into summer and then into the austral autumn. This is the tintinids here. They're always a very low minor component 
of the community when we just look at abundances <clears throat> excuse me but when we convert those um, abundances to biomass or bio volume we can see that at times they are actually a reasonable component um, of the community we're mostly seeing the hyaline species at the SOTS and the agglutinating species are rare and it's not until we really put these um, samples under the electron microscope that we're actually um, able to see the diversity um, and some of the, you know, I just find this completely intriguing and hypnotizing almost to look at the um, complexity of these arrangements. So this is Acanthus damella minutissima. You can see that the lorica of the um, tintinid is very heavily agglutinated with um, particles with selected bits of phytoplankton. And so this one, this cell is agglutinating the individual coccoliths from six species of coccolithophorids. So this is the whole coccolithophore for Emiliana huxleyi and just one of these plates or, or liths is what we're seeing here and this is what's being agglutinated to the outside of the tintinid. Uh, and interestingly, the species that we're seeing attached to the outside of the lorica are broadly representative of the species that we see in the water column. It's sort of in the similar proportions. And Emiliana Huxley is an incredibly well st studied um, coccolithophorid, um, partly because of its um, habit of having different calcification morphotypes. So we can see four of the six calcification morphotypes that we typically see in the Southern Ocean here. This is work that was done by, uh, with Andres Rigual Hernandez when he came to visit us uh, last year. Um, and we can see these very small, lightly calcified forms, type C. This is, these are rare in the water column and they're also low abundance on the lorica. The most common in the water column is this type BC. This is two forms of type BC, and we can see that this is what's most commonly agglutinated to the outside of the cell. Um, and then rare again is this type A, which is one of these heavily, more heavily calcified forms. Um, and it's interesting that what we're seeing basically is that the ratio of liths, calcification liths, about morphotypes in the water column is very similar to what we see on the outside of the lorica. Uh, this is another example of um, the same species from the subantarctic zone. This time these, these images were supplied by Rick Vandenen at the Australian Antarctic Division. This time we can see the entire lorica is covered with the individual coccoliths from a range of um, coccolithophorid species. And if we look um, at close at this section, you can see that almost every spare nook and cranny of that lorica is occupied with um, parts of coccolithophorids. Um, and these are just one part of um, a number of osteoliths that the genus Ophiaster can produce. Um, and here we're just seeing some rhomboliths from Calcia salina. So this is highly selective placement. Um, and there's a beautiful paper that I referred to in 1996 by Vazic, where she suggested that tintinids might actually be ingesting the coccolithophores, dismembering them, selecting the pieces that they want, and then placing them outside on the outside of the lorica, which is just absolutely staggering and beautiful. And if anyone was going to be able to capture this on video, it would be just mind blowing. So there's a challenge for you. Um, the last case study that I want to talk about is the K-axis ecosystem study. This was a marine research voyage that we did to the Kerguelen Plateau here in East Antarctica in the summer of 2015-16, um, looking at primary production, phytoplankton community composition, krill and fish surveys to build a picture of um, ecosystem structure and function in the region. Um, we're fortunate, I spent a lot of time um, doing live um, microscopy on board looking at quantitative and semi-quantitative sampling. Um, and at times we were sailing into significant um, levels of primary production. So this is a large diatom bloom just here south of the Banzaro Bank. Um, when these samples came back to Hobart, I did some electron microscopy, but I'm just gonna show you quickly now some of the observations from on board and the value of taking a microscope and camera system with you if you can. So it's previously been recorded many times in the literature that when tintinids agglutinate diatoms to the outside of their lorica, that they are only sticking dead cells onto the outside. We found time and time again that there were 
diatom cells that looked like they had healthy cytoplasm, um, active chloroplasts. They just looked like uh, in the same condition as the uh, diatoms floating in the water samples. And when we look at these under fluorescence, we can see that the chloroplasts are indeed autofluorescing. So these are paired images, this one in phase contrast, this one in fluorescence, this one bright field, this one in fluorescence of the same cells. And what we're showing here is conclusively that these diatoms that are attached to the outside of the lorica are indeed alive. By happy circumstance, my colleagues um, Linda Armbrecht and Leanne Armand and Amy Leventa had done a similar latitudinal survey on the Nathaniel Palmer and independently came to the same conclusions and we were able to pull our observations from Aurora Australis and the Nathaniel B. Palmer um, to provide the first record of living sea ice diatom agglomeration on tintinids in East Antarctica. And we hypothesised that this was not only allowing the tintinids to avoid predation through camouflage, but it may actually be providing them with a readily available food source in times of um, in times of need. So just before I finish up, this is just um, one of the examples of SEM micrographs when we look at the samples um, back in Hobart. And what I'm showing here is that there is very specific placement of the um, agglutinated diatoms on the outside of the lorica. So the, the collar is completely free. The upper part of the lorica is really only populated with fragments of, of a range of species. Some we can identify easily by very distinctive components. So this is Corythrum panatum. Um, other components are not so easily identifiable. But always consistently on this, this was Lacmaniella, that at the bottom part of the lorica, this is where we're starting to see um, complete frustules and living cells attached. And so whether this was has been grazed on or it's just fragments um, and that the heavy cells are attached at the bottom to help with ballasting, uh, we're not sure. Um, but um, at the moment, we're still, I'm still counting to see, look at species diversity and we're seeing up to six species of um, Fragilariopsis attached to a single lorica. So I'll just stop there and um, hope that you've enjoyed your armchair tour of tintinids and the phytoplankton of our region. Um, Australia and the Southern Ocean do have rich plankton records, and, but the tintinids are an understudied and intriguing group of the microzooplankton that we'd like to continue to do more work on. It's been noted many times um, in the literature that there's generally a lack of confidence and accuracy in species identifications, and this can complicate our understanding of the ecology and the biogeography of these organisms. And we um, hope that by working with taxonomic experts to validate our observations, that the, these IMOS time series and research voyages can fill in some of the gaps in our region. And of course, morphology alone is really only one aspect of describing species richness, um, and it's critical to couple detailed microscopy observations with um, DNA-based observations and single cell analyses, and this is a future focus. And so just in summary, for the agglutinating species, we've seen that they not only select, but are also arrange the particles on the surfaces in highly specific ways, and that the origin and the size of those particles reveals the nature of the ecosystem in which the lorica was built. So please, I encourage you to keep an eye out for these in your samples and let me know what you find. So thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for very nice and Amazing, beautiful images, really beautiful images. We do get here in Singapore quite often in our uh, nets, uh, the, the ones that agglutinate. And we also see this pattern that we, you saw uh, where they agglutinate the diatoms and the diatoms are still uh, alive. We see clearly uh, that they are under the, the blue light, they are red, so they, they are Fantastic. healthy and they are there. So really, really thank you and super interesting. Uh, do we have more questions? Do we have any questions from the from the audience? Uh, either in the chat or okay, Mark, you raise your hand. You can unmute yourself. 
Hi, Ruth. Thanks. Uh, very nice, nice data. Uh, I, I don't, don't know much about tintillants, but you say they select the, 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 for agglutination, but how is this done? I mean, they look like nicely aligned, but is there any active process and can they avoid things they don't want sticking to their outside? This is a question for out of ignorance. <laughs> Yes, so it's been, this is one question I would love to see answered, you know, and if we could get video evidence of them actually doing this, it would solve the problem for us. But it's been proposed that what they actually do, especially for the coccolithophores, is actually ingest the whole cell, dismember it, select the pieces that they want, and then place them, incorporate them into the lorica. Um, that's probably our best guess as to what they do. Um, that's a highly sophisticated process and there's definitely um, a high level of organization. Um, and the, the thing that compounds that is that they actually don't seem to inhabit these lorica for very long. They can reject and, and then grow a new one reasonably frequently through their life cycle. So um, it must be a rapid process. Um, and at the moment, I think that they probably are ingesting um, dismembering the coccolithophores for the diatoms. Um, it's been suggested that once they've attached the diatoms to the outside, they're probably just ingesting the protoplasm, the cytoplasm from the inside of the cell um, because the diatoms are too big for them to actually take into their interior. So oh, we need to get some video. Yeah, no, thanks. Well, it's pretty cool. Thanks. Okay, uh, we have another, another question from the chat. Uh, where do they secrete the stick material? That is a very good question, and I don't know. There is a beautiful paper by, uh, I think it's Sabine Agatha in about 2010, I think it was, where she went into a lot of detail describing the mechanism um, of um, the nature of the, the glue or the cement that they use. Uh, but I don't know a lot of detail about that process, I'm sorry. So. Is, I don't know, is anyone in the audience able to answer that? Uh, we have, we don't, we have a haze brand, but I think it's for a question. I'm not sure okay. to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daniel, you can unmute yourself. Uh, Daniel, you want to make a question? Yeah. Um... Uh, can you keep in uh, live uh, these uh, tantinids for a bit, uh, or can you? Is there some species that uh, I know? I think it's it's impossible to keep them in culture, but can you keep them for uh, some time? And uh, if you keep them, uh, will they still accumulate actually uh, biomaterial? Uh, so there have been a couple of people that have been able to successfully culture them. There's some beautiful work by Laval Pueto, I think it was in the early 90s, where she was actually able to kind of close the life cycle um, and study um, some of the morphological diversity by maining, maintaining some species in culture, but it's difficult. They're very sensitive and fragile, um, and we often find that when you capture them, they just abandon the lorica. Um, and certainly if you observe them under the microscope, they don't like the heat and light and um, they kind of wither very quickly. Uh, so it is possible to culture them, but not all species. It's even harder to do it with um, Antarctic or polar species. Um, but it's probably the, um, that will be the way that we can unfold some of these um, very curious processes of agglutination. So yeah, good question. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Ruth, again. Uh, we have to move quick to the next talk by Elizabeth. Can you try to share your screen, Elizabeth? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, working good. Uh, so just a quick introduction to Elizabeth. She's an evolutionary biologist. And she's based in the Massey, Massey University in New Zealand where she has focused her research uh, on adaptation of uh, natural microbial populations. And today she'll talk about population genomics uh, of dictyostadium, right? Right, okay. So thank you so much to the organizers for the opportunity to speak 
So I'm gonna dive right in. I work on an organism called Dictostelium discoidium, also known as a cellular slime mold or social amoeba. These organisms exist as single-celled amoebae in the soil, but in response to starvation, they undergo multicellular development. The cells aggregate into big mounds, and from these mounds emerge a migratory um, multicellular slug, and the slug eventually transforms into a fruiting body. About 20% of the cells die to form a stalk, and the remaining 80% of the cells survive as spores. So death of the stalk cells is thought to be an example of altruism. More specifically, the differentiation into these two cell types, spore and stalk, can be considered analogous to um, germline soma distinction that we see in organisms with complex multicellularity. So aggregative multicellularity is quite perplexing to, perplexing to evolutionary biologists, and that's because you can have um, different genotypes co-aggregate to form a chimeric um, organism. And this genetic diversity within a single multicellular organism is thought to allow selection to favor um, genotypes that preferentially um, become part of the germline rather than contributing to the dead soma. So genotypes that preferentially form spores and avoid forming stalks. And several decades of work in this organism has shown that such genotypes exist in nature and can be generated in the lab through mutagenesis. One thing that we think is really important in this organism, so in Dictostelium discoidium, is that strains have the ability to recognize and avoid forming multicellular fruiting bodies with unrelated strains. So if you look at this bottom panel here, you can see two different isolates labeled with RFP and GFP. And you can see that they co-aggregate together, but by the time they reach the mound strain, the mound stage, the red and the green cells have partially separated out from one another. The genetic basis of this trait has been shown. It's caused by two genes, Tiger B1 and Tiger C1, which sit together on chromosome three. The Tiger C1 protein on the, present, on the surface of one cell is thought to bind to the Tiger B1 protein present on the surface of another cell. And it's thought that wild isolates need to have matching Tiger B1, C1 alleles in order for them to adhere to one another and proceed together through multicellular development. Now, Tiger B1 and Tiger C1 actually are not the only Tiger genes in the genome. They actually belong to an extremely large gene family, in fact, the largest gene family in Dictostelium. Um, and while we know about Tiger B1 and C1 and their functional roles in kin recognition, we have absolutely no idea what any of these other genes might be doing. Many of them are pseudogenes, so we're not certain if they have any function at all. And RNA-seq analysis so far suggests that no more than a handful are um, expressed under any of the conditions that people have looked at so far. Tiger genes are extraordinarily polymorphic. So this is a distribution of um, sequence diversity in dictostelium across all the genes in the genome. It's a very uh, genetically depauperate species. So actually most genes in the genome will have absolutely no sequence variation among strains. We have this extremely long uh, right tail of the distribution representing extremely polymorphic genes. And these um, members of the tiger gene family are vastly overrepresented um, in this right tail of the distribution. Um, so one of the things that we think has been going on here, so we've also done Sanger sequencing as well of these genes, is that we think that um, what makes these genes so polymorphic is, is potentially that they can import sequence from duplicated paralogous genes. So right here I'm showing a, just a little piece of an alignment of the Tiger B1 gene. This is the gene involved in kin discrimination. Each row represents a different strain, and the colors represent different uh, nucleotide variants. And so we can see here that just in this little stretch, we have several different allelic types that are present. And if we compare this gene to a neighboring duplicated gene called Tiger B2, we can see that we have the exact same polymorphisms that are shared across genes. And the most likely explanation is either gene conversion or else non-allelic homologous uh, recombination allowing um, sequence variation from other members of the gene family to get introduced into Tiger B1 and allowing these genes to be extremely polymorphic. So I like to think of this as like a Rubik's Cube where they're able to generate this polymorphism very quickly um, through these events. 
One thing that matters is not just that tiger B1 and C1 are extraordinarily polymorphic across the species, but whether or not they're really polymorphic over the extremely small spatial scales in the soil where strains are likely to encounter one another and make a decision about whether or not to participate in multicellular development together. And for this reason, my lab has focused on these very small 10 by 10 centimeter plots that we've taken throughout the, the US. Um, and we've done a lot of genomic characterization of the strains that we find in these small soil samples, as well as Sanger sequencing of Tiger B1 and C1 loci. So these are just two haplotype networks for, gene for Tiger B1 and C1. Each circle represents um, a single allele or haplotype. Lines connect different alleles, and the numbers here indicate the number of nucleotide differences between these alleles. The size of the circle is proportional to the number of strains that show that allele, and the colors indicate the, the site of the geographic site of origin of that soil sample. And so the main point that I want to make here is just that even in these little 10 by 10, 10 by 10 centimeter plots, we see very, very divergent alleles, usually two or three in each of our soil samples, indicating that we see a lot of um, genetic diversity even over these really tiny spatial scales in the soil. So just to summarize, we, uh, aggregative multicellularity can potentially lead to intra-organismal intra conflicts, and we think that kin recognition systems can help reduce these conflicts by limiting multicellularity to closely related individuals. In the case of tiger B1 and C1, we think that the membership of these genes within a larger gene family may be really crucial to how they attain and maintain their extraordinary levels a sequence polymorphism and therefore for their, their effective function, function in, as kin recognition systems. And so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for such chronometer.